Welcome everyone to this session on running effective security incident response simulations. Bit of a mouthful, I know. Um, my name is Richard, for those of you that I haven't met before, which I'm guessing is gonna be most of you, because if you can't tell from my accent, I come from Brisbane, Australia, right the way around the other side of the world. I'll introduce myself a little better in just a second, uh, but first, I have a confession to make. There is no code and there are no demos during this talk. So I thought to myself, how can I keep everyone on the edge of their seats, listening, engaged? And then I thought, audience participation. Now, I don't wanna do anything that you don't want to do. So can I get a show of hands for people who don't want to participate? Anybody? We've got a couple of hands. I see a couple of people smiling. Uh, this is a silent session, so this, this is all the participation I'm gonna be needing for today. So for those of you who raised your hands, thank you for showing you're willing to participate. And for everyone else, thank you for being willing to participate. So now that I have this 100% participation rate, let's take it for a spin and see what we can do. How many of you work for an organization that has some sort of formal incident response capability? So this could be a team of people, it could be someone who wears a cap on Thursdays, but formal incident response capability. Hands up high so I can see them. Excellent, so that's, that's about 90, per, so I'm gonna go with 90% of you, which is, which is good news. Now, of those people who have incident response capability, how many of you test that capability by running exercise or simulations regularly? And by that I mean at least once a year, but preferably more. Okay, I, I'm gonna go with about 40% of you for that, which is good. I was expecting around that number, that's good to hear. But that also divides us up into three distinct groups of people. First, we've got people that don't yet have incident response capability. And for you guys, I'm hoping that you'll see the benefits of building simulations into your incident response capability as you develop that capability. Second, we have our group of people that have incident response capability, but are not yet running simulations, not yet testing that. And for you guys, I'm hoping to show you a nice easy way to start doing those simulations, running those exercises, and build up that capability and improve your processes. And thirdly, for those of you who have IR capability and you're already running simulations of some kind, I'm hoping you'll either be able to run them faster with less effort in the future, or else get slightly better results from what you're already doing. So that, that's my goal for this session. So now we've, we've talked about you for a bit. Let me tell you why I'm the one standing up on stage talking about this in front of you. I started life back at AusCert, the National CERT team for Australia. And there I participated in a number of drills. I should say drill, exercise, test, and simulation. I'll be using all of these interchangeably for this. And I participated in a number of, of drills, didn't think terribly much of it until I moved to my next role where I looked after incident response and threat detection for Suncorp, a financial services company in Australia and New Zealand. And there I had to think about how to improve the team. We had to do these for regulatory reasons, but we also wanted to have the best incident response team we possibly could. And so the hat was, the, the shoe was on the other foot or the, I had to wear that other hat to think about how do I improve the team's capability? What benefits does testing actually give me versus the time I have to put into it? And then I joined AWS. And at AWS, I wear two different hats. The first of those is I work for professional services and I help look after an offering we have called Security Incident Response Simulations, hence the title of the talk. And there, as you may guess, we go into customers, help them run these sorts of uh, simulations. And I've learned a lot doing that as well. And I wanted to share some of what we've learned to try and get all of you running these in your organizations as well as you can. But first I wanna take a step back from security, a step back from technology, and talk about baseball. We are in Boston, so picture Fenwick Park, um, a baseball game, you're sitting in the seats, the team has yet to run out, you've got a beer in one hand, hot dog in the other, the crowd is all there, and you're looking forward to, if you live here, your next game, 
if you don't live here like me, your first game. And then you see the team run out onto the field. And you notice one of the guys is wearing a green uniform. Another person has two baseball gloves on. One guy's holding the bat backwards, another guy's running out with a cricket bat. And then you see someone arguing, no, I'm playing catcher today. No, I'm playing catcher today. Now, when we talk about baseball and, and professional baseball, what I'm talking about is unheard of. It's crazy. People would think of that and go, what's going on here? This is, this is too silly to even comprehend. But when we talk about incident response, the idea of people performing incident response or even peripherals, peripheral people performing and being part of incident response, like your legal teams, like um, your media teams, the idea of them doing this work without having gone through it before, done a lot of practice, uh, practice games, drills, exercises, working together, suddenly that's not so foreign to people. And when we, when we talk about sports, this is ex expected that you have a team that is well rehearsed, well prepared, ready to go. But when it comes to incident response, professional incident response, we don't always have this same mindset of people should be practicing regularly so that when an incident occurs, they're ready to go. They know what they're doing. They've tested their tools, their processes, etc. And that brings me to the second hat I wear. I'm also part of the AWS Customer Incident Response Team, or AWS CERT. And this is a team of people who helps AWS customers when they have a bad day in the cloud, when they have an active security event that they need assistance with. And in doing this, I've seen firsthand some of the benefits that people have when they have good incident response capability. They detect things faster, they triage and contain them sooner, and they recover from these events quicker. And so that is why I'm here today. I want people to have good incident response, tested incident response, so that they're able to respond to all these sorts of events faster and recover faster. All right, enough about sports. Let's have a quick look at what we're gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to start with an introduction to incident response and simulations. This is a level 200 talk. I wanna make sure everybody that's here is able to come along on this journey, even if you don't have a really good understanding of these already. So we'll start with that. And for those of you who are sitting there thinking, I know incident response, I know simulations, I'm all good, time for sleeping. I wanna challenge you, keep your brain engaged, see if there's bits of this where you can go, I hadn't thought of it that way, or we don't do it that way. Let's see if I can grab something and bring that along or bring that back to my organization so that we're able to improve what we're doing. Then I'm gonna go through the three stages of a simulation. Uh, the setup, mostly it's scenario creation. Then actually running an event in your organization. What do you do to run one of these events? Uh, and then correction of errors. And correction of errors is an Amazonian term. You may be familiar with post-incident review or lessons learned, but this is that what do you do after to make sure the benefits you're hoping to get actually get realized. And finally, a call to action, no prizes for getting what that is. I'll tell you up front, I want you all to go and run or improve your simulation capability, your exercise capability. All right, so the introduction. <clears throat> this is incident response. I'm hoping everyone is familiar with this NIST incident response lifecycle. You've got your green preparation, you've got orange and red where you're running, and then at the end you've got your post-incident activity. For the purposes of this, the middle bit, the run, I'm not terribly concerned about. So this is incident response. We prepare, we do it, we get our lessons learned. Actually, let me go back a slide. After we've got our lessons learned from our post-incident activity, there's that nice arrow coming back to preparation. And I like to think that that arrow is larger for a reason. And that's because of how important it is to take our learnings and not just go, oh, that was nice, but actually bring that back into our preparation phase and get better for the next time we're doing this. And so when it comes to simulations, where do you think they fit? Now, I can't ask you, so how many of you think that they fit in the prepare circle? Can I see a show of hands? Incident response simulations fitting into prepare. This isn't a trick question. I'll put my own hand up. I think they fit in prepare. They're designed to help you prepare. 
I'd like to challenge that a little bit though. They definitely do sit and prepare. It's about preparing yourselves for incidents. But as we talked through in the, the uh, agenda today, there are three parts to incident response. There's preparing for an incident response simulation. There's running an incident response simulation. And then there's the post-incident activity, get, taking your lessons and feeding them back into your preparation. So I like to think of it a little more like this. You prepare either for an incident or a simulation. You then run, again, either an incident or a simulation. And then this is the benefit of thinking of it like this. If you have incident response capability, you should already have a post-incident activity capability, framework, whatever you've got that already feeds back into your preparation. You can use this same thing, maybe tweaked a little bit, you can use this same thing to take the learnings from your simulation and ensure they get fed back into that prepare phase. All right, so that is incident response and how simulations, how I see simulations fitting into that. Let's talk about the types of simulations that exist. And there are three main types. There's tabletop simulations where everyone sits around a table and talks about what they would do. Then there's live on the other end simulations, which is where everyone actually does what they would do. And then in the middle, you have your hybrid, which is a bit of both. You, you're sitting around a table, maybe you're sitting at your computer. Some of it's talking about what would happen. Some of it's doing what would happen. And the reason these are split up typically like this is due to that complexity and effort. When you have a fully live scenario, it takes a lot of effort to set those up. And my goal here for today is to make sure everyone is running some sort of simulation. And to do that with tabletop exercises, which is the focus of today, you can do that with 20% effort and get 80% of, of the reward from that. So the old 80-20 rule more or less applies here. <clears throat> so these are the types of simulations. I'm trying to get you all to run these. Why? Why am I trying to get you to run these simulations? I've talked a bit about it, but the top two items on this slide, these are the main key pieces that running these simulations should give you. Improving your playbooks, your processes, and how you run an incident, how you do incident response. And then secondly, uncovering control, ga control gaps. So this is how you can improve your controls or are you missing certain types of controls? And I've got two slides on these. I'll go through them in a little more detail. But again, as I said, AWS cert hat on. Why to do this? Because it allows you to detect faster. It allows you to triage and contain quicker and recover sooner. And now you don't just do this fast so that you can look good to the boss and say, oh, yep, we did that in this time. Our KPI is met. The holistic goal of security is to help the business. And of course, the faster you can contain an incident and stop it growing, the more you can minimize the impact to the business of that incident. So that is the ultimate goal of running these sorts of simulations. Okay, let's dive into those top two. So improving playbooks, improving the documentation and the process part of it, uh, there's three parts that I split it into. First, you have your incident response plan. And this is a high level document that talks about how you do incident response at your organization. This is where you keep things that are common for all incidents, such as how you rate severity, maybe what tooling you use for ticketing systems and things like that. Then you come to incident response playbooks. And now these names get changed by a lot of different people, so don't take these names as gospel, um, but this is what I'm calling them today. You've got your incident response playbooks, and this talks about the what you do and the when you do it. So for example, you might want to contain an EC2 instance at a certain stage in your incident response lifecycle. These are also scenario specific guides. So for example, you might have a denial of service playbook. You might have a ransomware playbook. Separate to that is what I'm calling incident response runbooks. And these are the how you do that. So when you're containing an EC2 instance, how do you do that? What steps do you actually take? And the reason I split these two up is that you can get a wonderful one-to-many relationship between the two. Your playbooks can reference many runbooks. 
your run book can reference or be referenced from many playbooks. Now, for tabletop exercises, you're typically concentrating on the, on the left two items. Uh, these are the how you're, uh, the what you're doing and when you're doing it, the playbooks and the plan. The how you do it, the technical side, is much more where you're getting into the live or the hybrid type of scenarios. <clears throat> One other benefit of separating these out is that your incident response run books are the how. They're the technical pieces, which also means they're a fantastic place to start when you want to automate what you're doing. So if you're thinking of doing some automation, start by automating these parts, these documents that some of you already have, others may not, that you create. These are the, the place to start your automation. Okay, on to the control types. So when we're talking about improving controls, what am I talking about? First of all, preventative controls. I'm talking about the things that stop bad things happening. And if these worked well all the time and were everywhere we needed them to be, that's all we'll need. You and I all know that this is not the case. So we need our detective controls to find out when something is going wrong. And then once you've found something, you need to fix it with your corrective controls. And so all three of these types of controls are ones you should be thinking about when you're talking about improving your incident response capability after you've run a simulation. Okay, last part of our introduction, participants. I talked around everyone sitting around a table and talking about what they would do. Who is sitting around this table? So first of all, as you'd guess, your security team, your incident responders, your SOC team, security management and decision makers, these are good stakeholders to invite to these. We've also got our tech people, so our cloud engineers, our cloud architects potentially, our developers, people who are writing the code for the applications we're using. And of course, business. If you don't invite your business stakeholders and business representatives, you're missing a key link between the technical people who will be fixing all the things and the business who care about making sure their data is safe and the services are, are providing the customers with the the services and everything they want to do with the actual business. And of course, there's many other people you can invite. Don't limit yourself by that. Uh, customer support teams. If someone reports a security incident to a customer support team, do they know how to reach your security team? Tra internal training teams. Do they know what they should be training people on? The list here is endless. Um, unfortunately, I only had six people. So given we're all living in COVID times, I thought it was appropriate to have a dog video conferencing in for this other category. So this is who is participating in our scenario. What about people helping with our simulation? So who's supporting this? Well, first, we've got our facilitator and our scenario creator. They can be different people. In this, I'm putting them together. And this is someone who is running the scenario. And they have three main jobs, and I'll get to this in a bit. Uh, they give initial input, they start a scenario. They're responsible for the results of actions. And they're also responsible for probing and finding weaknesses in the response that people are taking, the actions people are taking. They don't have to be an incident response expert, but of course, incident response and security knowledge, as well as knowledge of the business, really helps if you're playing this role. This is the key role. In addition to this, because the facilitator will have their hands full, ha having someone to be the official note taker and write down all the steps that were taken, all the missteps were the, that were taken, all the discussions that people had, is a very important person to include in this. You're, as a facilitator, you're going to be thinking about all sorts of things and not having time to write things down. So having that person to write them down for you is, is essential. And finally, one that is often overlooked is observers. And these are people from different parts of the business who come in to watch. There's going to be a lot of knowledge sharing that happens when you're running these sorts of simulations. So getting other parts of the business involved, understanding, bringing back lessons and ideas into their own parts of the business, knowing that this exists can be very important. And I've, had a, I've run a lot of simulations where we've had more observers than the entirety of all participants put together. 
Okay, that's our introduction done. We now should all be on the same playing field as to what simulations are, what incident response is in the context of running these simulations. Before we dive into the actual stages of running a simulation, I just want to introduce you to an example company. And this is important because you don't design a scenario generically, you design it for a company, typically, for your own company. So I want you to have a company in mind as we go through creating a scenario and then how to run the scenario. So this is our theoretical customer. They are a European healthcare provider. So straight away my mind is thinking GDPR. Their servers, data storage, their internal apps, their websites, they're all in AWS. So they've, they've taken their data center, they've lifted it up, they've brought it across and they've put it into AWS. They of course use AWS identity and access management. And most of their data is stored in Amazon S3. They use other services, but these are the ones I want you to keep in mind as we go through this presentation. Next, I want to give you a bit of a security landscape that these, this company is playing within. So first of all, we'll start with a high level overview of security. Uh, so security in general, what are some of the security concerns that businesses have at the moment? And I've picked three. Ransomware, cryptocurrency mining, and phishing and social engineering. It's important to have these in mind when helping develop scenarios, as you'll see in a bit. We now move from general, the whole world, down into the healthcare industry specifically. And their worries are sensitive data access. They've got a lot of medical records. Denial of service. There's been a few denial of service problems recently. And then the, the type of business they're in means they will potentially have unpatched or legacy systems. Now we move down to this company specifically. What is this company worried about? Well, they also have legacy systems. Their security team, thankfully, has recently completed some AWS security training, which has also highlighted to them the fact that not all of the identity and access management users have multi-factor authentication enabled. And the risk office for this company has also highlighted that data disclosure is a big worry for them at the moment. Now, appropriate given the room we're in, the green room. You'll see three in green at the moment. Keep these in your head. There's a reason they're green. We'll get to those in a second. But now we start with our first of our three parts of running a simulation, creating a scenario. So how do we create a scenario? What goes into a scenario? Well, <clears throat> your company's threat models. Hands up if you think company's threat models, the threat modeling you do, is good to include as input into scenarios you're creating. Yeah, yeah, yes, more hands please. There we go, absolutely. If your company is worried about a certain type of threat, testing for what you would do if that threat was realized is extremely important. Previous security events. So say you've had a previous security event. Is that a good, good thing to include? Yes, yes, fewer hands for that one. I'm a little worried. Definitely, if you've had a previous security event, and hopefully you've gone through that cycle, that big arrow at the bottom, and you've fixed it, you should be testing that those fixes are actually working as you intend. What about industry or global trends? I won't get hands up for this one. I've just had a slide on them. Absolutely, if you're seeing things, if, if you're a healthcare provider, and other healthcare providers are worried about data loss or ransomware, it's something that you should probably consider as well. What about the latest technology? Hands up if you think you should be testing the latest technology or things going wrong with that. Some hands, some hands. Okay, um, this one I put a question mark on. Are you using the latest technology? Is it part of your business to have the latest blockchain whiz bang thing helping your business conduct business? If it is, absolutely, test it, test away. If it's not, don't be lured in by new technologies and the ability to, to play with them just to run simulations. It's not ideal. Lastly, AWS side of the shared responsibility model, should we be testing that? Um, I'm going with a no on that one. That's AWS's responsibility. So if you have a scenario where you've got someone parachuting in off a helicopter, landing on a data center, abseiling down a window, laser cutting out some glass and tunneling in, uh, not, not for you guys to be testing. That's something for AWS side of the shared responsibility model to be thinking about and securing against. 
So now that we know what goes into a scenario, how do we actually create one? And I'd like to give you a method that you can use. It's a generic method for creating simple, realistic scenarios. Simple, realistic scenarios tend to be the best kind because they enable you to test the most likely things that you're going to face. So we start with the impact. What impact do you want to consider for this scenario? Do you want to consider confidentiality, integrity, or availability? And this is quite high level. The main reason this is here is to get people thinking outside confidentiality. Next, B, or business asset. Is this simulation going to look at data, process, or system problems or issues? Following that is action. What is the unwanted action that's going to happen in this, sim in this simulation, in this scenario we're creating? And then we get a little lower. What service is going to be impacted? And finally, the entry method. How does this all start? How does an unauthorized user manage to do whatever they're doing? And so this, this is the framework. This gives you a nice, easy set of steps to follow to get some sort of simulation. I see a few people taking pictures. Just hold on one second. Um, but using this, it's still easy to get a scenario that is a bit silly, a bit out there, a bit crazy. So we have a final risk check at the end. And in this, you want to look at the likelihood and the impact of this sort of scenario happening. Now, for the impact, you don't want it to be too low. There's no point in testing a low impact scenario because by definition, it's low impact. So we're looking for a, a medium to high impact. The likelihood, on the other hand, that can be almost anywhere except the extremes. We don't want to be testing something that's extremely unlikely and never, never really going to happen. And we don't want to be testing something that happens frequently because we're probably already pretty good at dealing with that sort of scenario. <clears throat> okay, so let's make a scenario. Oops, there we go. So what impact shall we choose? Well, I know I said let's think about the others, but I'm going to be a, a stick in the mud and choose confidentiality. Uh, B, what business asset do we want to impact? And now this is where I'm hoping you remember those green items. So data and data loss was a big worry for our company. So in this instance, let's choose historic healthcare, health insurance claims. Action, what can happen to these claims? Well, again, thinking back to the green parts we had, data theft and ransom is something we could be worried about here. Next, what service? And again, do you remember where the data was stored? The data was stored in Amazon S3. So this is where our historic claim data is being stored for this company. And finally, entry method. How does the unauthorized user get access to this data? And again, we're thinking back to those green ones. We know that not all IAM credentials have MFA tied to them. So unintended IAM credential disclosure. Someone got a hold of some IAM credentials. Let's do a risk check on this. Is this a sensible scenario? Actually, before I do that, can I get a show of hands? Does this seem like a sensible scenario to test or is this a bit out there, a bit? Yeah, I was hoping for a few more hands actually. Let, let's go through the check though. Impact, impact is probably pretty high. You've lost a whole bunch of historical insurance data. The likelihood hopefully is reasonably low. You've got some security controls in place but it's not down that extreme end of the scale where it's never gonna happen, especially because we don't have MFA on some of our accounts, which makes that a bit more likely. So I think this passes the risk check and this, this would be a good scenario. But at the moment, this scenario is basically a list of dot points. The next stage is to turn it into a story, a narrative. Because when you have something as a narrative, a story, a flow of what's happening, it really helps you to understand it in your own mind so that as you need to add bits to it, change bits, as we'll see in a bit, it's much easier to do that. So this is our story. <clears throat> Unauthorized users obtain access to IAM keys to your AWS account. Now, I'll pause on this one for a second. Do we care how 
those IAM credentials were obtained or where they were obtained. Hands up if you think we need that piece of information. Yeah, there's a few hands. Um, no, absolutely not. You do not need this piece of information because this piece of information is exactly what the people sitting around that table have to find. That's their job. If this happened, if this scenario happened in real life, one of the first questions people are going to ask the incident response team is, how on earth did this un unauthorized user get these credentials? So in this scenario, that's one of the things we want to be testing. Now, to backpedal on that just a little bit, it is always good to have some idea of how this might have happened in your mind to keep this scenario fleshed out. But this is one of the bits I want to highlight. You don't need to have the entire everything story in your head when you create one of these. That's the role to get to these details. That's the role of the incident responders, of the people in this scenario. So continuing down the story, um, we've discovered that historic, uh, the attacker rather, discovers that historic claim data was in the S3 bucket. They copy or download some of that data. They delete the data, delete the S3 bucket. And then this bit, it's purple for a reason. They then send a ransom note to the company. And this is a very key piece of information. This is what we're choosing to start our incident with. So this is the piece of an incident that kicks everything off. Okay, who are we gonna to bring to this scenario? Hands up if you think our security IR people should be involved. Good, excellent. Security management, excellent. Tech, so our cloud or infrastructure engineers, are they involved? Some hands, some hands, yes. This one is a bit of a depends, a, it depends. If they're involved in the way all this happened, they may well be a really good person to bring along. However, depending on how companies are set up, maybe not. What about tech, your developers, your app developers? No hands at all, oh, well done. Um, and again, unless they're involved in using S3, storing this historical data, or the application that may have been impacted, then no, we don't really need to bring these people along as participants. What about business, legal? Yes, yeah, absolutely. PR media, social media? Yes, yep, absolutely. What about other? Are there other people we should be bringing along? Again, I'll say it depends. The bigger the scope, the more people you bring, to participate in the scenario, this is not observing, this is participating, the more people you bring along to participate, the more people will be talking, the more discussion, the longer things will run. So that's one of the things you can use to control how long a scenario goes for and how much detail and how many areas you go into. So maybe. All right, next we'll move on to tabletop event execution. So this is actually running this scenario, this, this simulation. So we're all sitting in a room around a table and I've got three stages for how to do this. Uh, but first I've got a bonus one to give you. And I know I said there was an official note taker, but I would like to say everybody involved, everyone in the meeting, everyone in the room should be taking notes. And the reason for that is everyone involved will have a different perspective They'll come from a different part of the company. They'll know about different products, services, configurations, ways of working. And you will find that the notes you get from your legal team will be vastly different to the notes you get from your IR team or from your developers. They will know about different projects, the state of them, um, secret projects that may not be widely communicated. So if you get everyone to take notes, and this is not scribbling down notes the whole time. This is when they go, oh, that's a really important related piece of information. Getting everyone to take notes is so important. That's why it's got its whole slide, whole slide to itself. So now everyone's taking notes. Let's start with the first step. And that is introduction, scene setting. When you have a tabletop scenario, so much of it is about people talking. No one's on the keyboard, no one's typing, no one's clicking, running. All they're doing is talking about what they would be doing. And in many cases, these people have not met each other before. It uh, depends on the size of the company, but the legal team may have never met the incident responders. So to start with, start with everyone introducing themselves, start with an icebreaker, start with lunch, start with nibbles and drinks, get people talking, 
that human connection will be essential for speedy communication when a real incident happens. Next, we want to describe how the simulation will work. And this is a role play type of event. So you'll be telling everyone involved, they're playing their own roles. If you would do something, say you would do it. And this is really trying to highlight to everyone the fact that they need to speak up, they need to talk, and they need to say what exactly they would do. Uh, next, you describe your facilitator role. Um, I, I won't describe it here because I'll be describing it on the next slide. It's a bit of a meta point, this one. Um, <clears throat> but you describe your facilitator role so that everyone knows what you're doing and more importantly, what you're not doing. You're not there to give a lecture or step people through. And the last point, the separate bit down the bottom, this is essential. Um, tell people not to fight the scenario. You will get a scenario, you will make a scenario that does not work. Um, hopefully nothing as bad as an S3 type scenario like we created when a company doesn't use S3, but there will be problems with a the scenario, there will be things that don't work. Get people to focus on what would we do if it did happen rather than finding the holes and the problems. And secondly, and I'll talk about this a couple of times, this is the most important thing for every scenario, and that is having a positive mindset, having a forward-looking mindset. Think about it from an incident responder or a um, platform owner's point of view. They've spent their last four years building up an incident response capability, building up their tooling, testing everything, and now we've got a whole bunch of people sitting around trying with the sole purpose of trying to find holes with and problems with what's happening. Now, if you know, if you're an incident responder sitting there and you know about a problem, you know this tool doesn't work properly, are you gonna speak up knowing that everyone's gonna look at you and go, you're telling me for four years you've been doing that and you couldn't get it to work? So from as high up management as you can all the way down, it's essential to get buy-in that this is not a backwards looking blame exercise. I would love, I love, in fact, nothing more than seeing people go, actually, I know that this doesn't work properly and having their manager go, what? It, it doesn't work? And watching them go, this is a point where we move forward together and get better together. I don't care that it doesn't work, that you may have made a mistake in the past. I'm gonna stop harping on about that now, but it is so important. Second stage. So we've set the scene, everyone's comfortable, they're fed, they're drunk, drunk not drunk, they've had their drinks. <laughs> and now we're getting into actually running the scenario. So this, you'll remember there were two points on one of my slides about improving the processes and around looking at the controls. These are the next two, part two and three stages. This one is about testing those procedures, going through those procedures. So as a facilitator, you'd introduce the scenario starting point. So in this case, it was a ransom note. And so you'd put that up on a projector, put a piece of paper on the table, verbally tell them however you want, you tell them how it starts. Then you hand over to the participants and be quiet. Once that ransom note is received, part of what you, part of what the note taker wants to do is observe what do they do? If, you're, if the incident responder received one of those, would they start a war room? Would they bring out their playbooks that they have? Or would they just suddenly start shooting from the hip and going off the top of their head? What do they do? And I can tell you from experience, so many scenarios that I run, companies have playbooks, but when you hit them with this initial starting point, they'll start talking about, I'd do A, I'd do B, I'd do C, I'd do D, I'd contain, I'd eradicate, I'd recover, we're all good. And that's, that's not really what we want. Everything can move fast when you just say it. We want to go backwards. And this is where that middle point comes in. Everything should move at the pace of the facilitator. So if you have someone that says, oh, I would change that security group to contain the EC2 instance, I'd recover from a snapshot, I'd restore from the database backup, I'd write a PIR and now we're done. Your job as a facilitator is to rewind, go all the way back to the beginning and say, first thing you do, security group, did you say? How would you do that? What would you do? Take me through this step by step. So what about determining the impact? Have you thought, and this is where you can probe for those weaknesses that I was talking about before. You wanna, if you think of it like a tree, you wanna do both breadth and depth in that tree. And most people like to do breadth where you do all your things and we're done. So your job as a facilitator is to get into those deep parts and try and probe for those weaknesses. 
Because when you find weaknesses, that's where you can find improvements. Um, so that's the facilitator, as I said, they provide that starting point. They have two other roles. They need to provide answers for anyone who's not present. So if the legal team can't make it, and the playbook says, get legal's approval for something, that's now the facilitator's job. And you don't need to be a legal expert. You can just say either yes or no to most things. And that can determine how far deep you go in that area. So would legal approve this? Yes, they would, of course. And then the scenario continues on. Um, if someone's a bit more technical, if someone's looking up an IP address and they say, I would look up this IP address, does it show any hits for other activity? No, it doesn't, because we don't want to dive more into that. Or yes, it does if you do want to dive. And that's where you can control the scenario and where it goes a bit. Um, and finally, I've already covered it actually, providing results for actions taken. So if someone looks up that IP address, you say whether or not it would happen. If you send out a media campaign, you get to decide, does media, uh, do, do media people contact the company for more information? Does the attacker change what they're doing? <clears throat> so that's scenario facilitation. Your role as a, as a facilitator is not to walk them through it, but it's to see what they would do and then probe in for weaknesses. Our third part controls discussion. So we've just walked through with a group of people an entire scenario from the start of detecting it with that ransom note all the way through to containment, eradication, recovery, and then post-incident potentially. That third part, uh, controls discussion, this is the perfect time to talk about controls. Everything is fresh in our heads. We've just been through this scenario. So what I recommend here is going through each of those three control types we had one by one and looking for what controls already exist and how can they be improved and what controls could exist or don't exist that we could have improving our capability. And you'll find this is the time where you get a lot of good answers and a lot of people coming forward now that they've been talking and saying, well, here's all sorts of controls that we, we have that don't work well enough or here are some new controls. And then you take this away and feed this into your process, which I'll get to in a bit. So that's, that's facilitation. We now move on to correction of errors or post-incident. If you already have this, feed it into that process. I'm gonna go through correction of errors at a high level. This is an Amazonian term. And this is about making sure that we fix the problems we need to fix. We're fixing the right problems. We're making sure they're fixed well. And we're making sure they stay fixed. So this is not about a quick fix, this is about the right fix. Now, I'll get back to that in a second, but first, notes. I told everyone to take notes. The first thing you wanna do, collate them all, have a look at them, you'll find three things. Things that you do well and you wanna keep doing, and if you need some sort of positive out of this to, to sell to people, you'll see a lot of things you do well. Next, you'll find problems you know about, and this will help lend data points to why you're fixing these problems. Maybe bump them up the priority list. And then you'll find problems you didn't know about. And these, these are the gold nuggets that you can get. I love nothing more than being on a call with a customer and having them realize they do not have this piece, this process, this whatever it is, often small, but to see their eyes light up and go, oh, we really need that. That makes me really enjoy doing this sort of thing. And, and getting that for the customer that they didn't know was missing. So now you've got these, you've got your notes. It's now time for correction of errors. So what is correction of errors? It's a deep dive process. It's how we go about getting through to what we're doing. It's all around improving the quality of our systems and our documentation. And it's designed to address, to share findings and address with actionable outcomes, actionable actions, trackable actions, to track trackable actions that we can use to improve things in the future. And just like in a scenario or in a simulation, it is not about blame, punishment, retribution, scapegoating, or negative in any way. This is all intended to be a positive process, a forward-looking process. So what do we do now? We write the correction of errors report. Now you might be thinking, a report, document, bit boring, 
Um, the document is where you contain it all together. The actual actions and things that come out of this is the important bit. You start with a summary, or in fact, in my opinion, you end with a summary, but up the top of the document, you have a summary. Then you've got your observations. This is facts. What you saw during the event. You saw this thing happen. That's all. It's just the facts. The next stage is reasons for concern. This is why those facts need change in some way. You can use the five whys method if you want to help really dig into the problem here. Uh, but after that, we've now got our facts. We've got, um, we've got our reasons for concern. We've got our problems. Now we write our lessons learned or our findings. And these are simple dot points, what the problems are. All the justification is up above. These are the dot points of here are our findings. And finally, we create SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and tracked. You remember that big arrow right at the beginning, incident response going back into prepare? If we go through this whole process and we have all these actions and someone writes them down in a wonderful COE report and that gets filed in section seven of our filing cabinet, that's a fail. That big arrow is the important bit. These need, in fact, I have an entire slide just for that one piece. These tracked actions need to be turned around into that preparation and these need to be implemented. You learn a lot from going through this, but it's the implementation of these that gets you the real benefit at the end. Okay, finally, summary and call to action. What have we talked about today? We've talked about adding simulations into the IR, IR life cycle, building it all in together. Talk about what simulations are, some of the benefits that they can bring, some of the benefits I've seen firsthand around having good IR. We talked about the IBASA method um, that I would love all of you to use or consider using parts of when you create scenarios for your own tabletop exercises. We talked about how to facilitate an incident, what you need to do, and then the process improvement and the control part. We talked about having a positive mindset. Everything about finding problems should be positive. And finally, using the COE process to provide smart actions. So this is my call to action to you. Use the IBASA method, create a scenario, run it, and show the benefits that you can get by driving that big improvement life cycle all the way around. Now, if, you're, if you've seen this and you're going, actually, I still need a bit of help, there's two good places to get help your AWS account team and AWS partner network or AWS security competency partners. So get help if you need it. They're, they're, willing and they're willing to run these for you and help you know what to run if you need help. And finally, TDR 332, response preparation with ransomware tabletop exercises. There's a session running tomorrow. If you're interested in this and want to know more, that's a great one to go and check out. And with that, if you have questions, I will be hanging around for, to, to have a chat with you. Feel free to reach out via email or LinkedIn. I love, maybe you can tell, I love talking about this. I love simulations. It's one half of my job. The other is helping people. Do reach out. I will easily find the time to talk to anyone who wants to talk. And with that, thank you very much for coming. And please fill out the uh, survey. I'll go back in case anyone wants to capture that. Um, please fill out the survey. And thank you for your time.